Hi everybody! So today we're going to take a look at a corundum sphere and some of the fun experiments you can do using a polariscope with a corundum sphere. So currently these corundum spheres come in two different sizes. Right now they're all the same color, so they're a dark red for a ruby. And these are of course made of synthetic flame fusion corundum, or else uh, they would be very prohibitively expensive. So the two sizes are 10 millimeters and 20 millimeters, and these aren't perfect spheres, but they're close enough that they're completely acceptable for what we want to use them for. So if you want to follow along with the experiments in this video, you can purchase a corundum sphere at the eBay store Snellius Minerals. So these are actually a little different from my other products because most of the other ones I create myself. These I've actually purchased from another vendor who you could also find on eBay. I'd certainly appreciate if you buy them from me. That'll help support me in making my educational videos. And the other benefit of purchasing these from me is that I actually test them all out before I'd send them to you. Uh, sometimes you can find some issues with stress in the flame fusion corundum, making things a little less than ideal. So we have talked a whole bunch about corundum in many of our other videos. You can see our other corundum based product in the video Snellius Minerals Corundum Kit. And the video Optical Mineralogy Big Picture Summary is actually a deep dive into the mineral corundum. So if you want more in-depth descriptions of what's going on with the mineral corundum, I suggest uh, checking out those videos. Here we're going to go through things pretty quickly uh, just to give you a brief overview before we start looking at the optical properties of our spheres. So going out to the really big picture of what's going on here, we have a mineral and that mineral is going to be defined by its chemistry and structure. The chemistry and structure of our mineral determine the crystallography that we'll see, as well as the physical properties and how those vary with direction in our mineral. We're focused on the optical properties of our minerals, but you could pick something else as well, such as uh, electrical conductivity. So our corundum is defined by its chemistry and structure. In the case of corundum, uh, its chemical formula is aluminum oxide, Al2O3, and its structure is that of oxygen in a hexagonally closest packed arrangement with two-thirds of the octahedral interstices filled by aluminum cations. Here's a model of the chemistry and structure of corundum at the micro scale. The chemistry and structure of our corundum determine the macroscopic crystallography of our corundum, and then also the optical properties of our corundum as well. When focused on the optical properties of corundum, we want to think about the optical indicatrix for corundum. This is a three-dimensional representation of the refractive indices of our corundum, and this is ultimately a result of the chemistry and structure of our corundum. So our corundum is a uniaxial mineral, meaning that it's going to be defined by two different refractive indices, epsilon and omega. Corundum is also uniaxial negative, meaning that refractive index epsilon is less than refractive index omega. For our uniaxial minerals, refractive index omega is going to be aligned with the plane of the A axes, and refractive index epsilon is going to be aligned with the C crystallographic axis. So right now we're looking at two of the most important views of our optical indicatrix for corundum. The view looking down the C crystallographic axis, and a view looking along the plane of the A axes. Why are these two views the most important? Because they show us the most disparate behaviors we're going to be able to see with our corundum, and this in turn gives us the information we need to either identify our mineral or to orient our mineral in space. So for example, for corundum, when looking down a view that's along the plane of the A axes, we'll see the maximum birefringence. When viewing the sample in plain polarized light, we have the possibility of seeing pleochroism. When viewing the sample with crossed polarizers, we'll see the extinction and transmission of light. Uh, if we had a thin section of our sample, this would be the view with the highest order interference color, which we could use to then calculate the birefringence. And this view will also provide us with a flash interference figure. In contrast, our view looking down the C crystallographic axis will have no birefringence because we're only seeing refractive index omega. 
There won't be any pleochroism as we rotate our sample in plane polarized light, but that lets us know what pleochroic end member color is associated with refractive index omega. The sample should stay extinct with crossed polarizers in this view, however given the stress in our flame fusion corundum this isn't exactly what happens. And then uh, we can also generate a uniaxial optic axis interference figure in this view. So let's start out examining our corundum sphere with our polariscope. Uh, we'll start off here in transmitted plane polarized light. Note that our plane polarized light is vibrating in a north-south direction. But we're going to quickly transition to viewing our sphere with crossed polarizers. And this is actually going to help us understand some of the complications that arise from viewing a sample that is spherical. So we bring in our upper polarizer and I'm going to start to move and rotate the sample around so that we can get some different views of our corundum sphere. We can see areas where the sphere is transmitting light and areas where it uh, goes to extinction. But when I get the sphere oriented just right, what we're going to be able to see is actually a uniaxial optic axis interference figure. But wait, I haven't set up my polariscope to generate a uniaxial optic axis interference figure yet. We're just at cross polarizers. So what's going on here with our corundum sphere? In order to figure this out, we're going to have to go all the way back to our example of Snell's law, and we're going to have to think about our refractive indices and the refraction of light. Here's the example of Snell's law we took a look at all the way back in the Optical Mineralogy Isotropic Materials video. Let's do an updated step-by-step -step version of this problem now so we can understand what's going on with our corundum sphere. And we're going to start simple with this problem by thinking of a cube of spinel and light traveling through that in one particular plane. So in this example, we're going to think about a single ray of light traveling through air and interacting with our spinel cube. Because our air and spinel have different refractive indices, when the light reaches the interface between these two substances, it's actually going to be refracted as it travels into our spinel cube. Snell's law provides us with the relationship between our angle of incidence, in this case angle A, and our angle of refraction, in this case angle B. And with a bit of math, we can figure out that if angle A in this example is 45 degrees, angle B will have to be 24.3 degrees. In this example, my light rays are just schematic. Don't get out your protractor and check angle A and B. They're not going to be 45 and 24.3 degrees. Now let's redo this example and reduce angle A and see how it influences angle B. If angle A is instead 30 degrees, then angle B ends up being 16.9 degrees. And if we take our example all the way to the point where our light ray is actually traveling perpendicular to the surface of our cube, what ends up happening is the light ray enters our spinel without any reorientation of the direction of travel of the light. And this is the reason why I actually like cubes and slices and other sorts of geometries where we have two parallel planes that are going to be perpendicular to our light source because then we don't actually have to deal with Snell's law at all and think about the refraction of light as it interacts with our substances. For our minerals, their interactions with light are already complicated by their anisotropy. No need to put a complicated geometry in there too. And so this is part of the inspiration for what I'm doing here with uh, Snellius Minerals. And it's a bit cheeky to call it Snellius Minerals because I'm spending a lot of time actually trying to avoid dealing with Snell's Law. But to be honest, the actual discoverer of the Law of Refraction was Ibn Sal. At some point, I'll probably try and make a little history video about what was going on with the discovery of refraction, but that's a topic for another day. Let's get back to examining light interacting with our spinel cube. The real beauty of our simple cube geometry becomes apparent when we try and trace many different rays through our cube, and in using our polariscope, Samples that have two parallel faces that are perpendicular to the direction light is traveling through our sample are going to be the simplest to think about. So what happens when we try and think about light traveling through a sphere of spinel instead? 
Well, there's one ray path that's going to be pretty much exactly the same as the cube, and that's this one that's shown here. But the complications become apparent as soon as we try and add on additional rays of light. So with our additional ray of light here just striking the sphere in a different spot, we have to think about Snell's law. And once we figured out the new direction of our light ray, once it strikes the opposite side of our spinel sphere, we're going to have to think about Snell's law again. And we actually get a bonus complication for thinking about this interaction, because if angle A is actually greater than the critical angle of our spinel, our light ray ends up being totally internally reflected, and then we get to try and hunt down where it actually ends up exiting the sphere. So now that we've explored some of the complications that our spherical geometry causes for us with an isotropic material like spinel, who's ready to explore the complications that come from examining a sphere of an anisotropic substance like corundum, where we've got multiple refractive indices that vary with orientation through the sphere? And uh, uh, the answer is not me. I'm not going to do that. That hurts my brain. So instead, what I'm going to do is say the following. The closer we are to the middle of our sphere when we're looking at our light rays, the less crazy things are. So stick to looking towards the middle of the sphere and you'll be alright. And once again, the moral of the story is light traveling through a cube of material is much simpler to understand than light traveling through a sphere of a material. Let's get back to where we left off our corundum sphere with crossed polarizers. So the reason why we actually see an optic axis interference figure here is because the corundum sphere itself is actually acting as a converging lens. No need to add a converging lens on when the shape of your sample is already doing that job for you. So this is one thing that actually makes the corundum sphere pretty cool. And now seeing this optic axis interference figure, we know exactly the direction we're looking through our sphere, we're looking along the optic axis of our corundum, which means we're also looking along the C crystallographic axis. So taking a look at our corundum sphere with crossed polarizers helps us quickly orient our sphere in space. Now let's examine this direction through our sphere in plane polarized light. And so given this view along the optic axis of our corundum, we know that when we rotate the sample, we shouldn't see pleochroism. And that's because light traveling through this direction of our corundum should only be interacting with refractive index omega. Well, barring complications arising from its spherical geometry. So let's try rotating the sample in this direction and see if we notice any pleochroism. And so there's not much change going on here. Uh, the differences you do see are caused by my camera adjusting its brightness as I move fingers in and out of the field of view. So this is the 10 millimeter corundum sphere. It's a little difficult to manipulate, and so what I'm also going to do here is bring in my upper polarizer again and check and see if with all that rotation I've wandered away from looking down the optic axis. So we wandered a bit off axis, but not too bad, so I think that was an accurate representation of the lack of pleochroism in this direction. So back to plane polarized light. Now let's see if we can actually reorient our sphere so that we're looking down the plane of the A axes. And so that requires a 90 degree flip. And what I hope you can notice here is the color actually did change there. It's hard to tell though given the lighting changes too. So our plane polarized light is vibrating in a north-south direction. And so with that flip, we've actually aligned the plane polarized light with refractive index epsilon. So if I bring in my upper polarizer in this orientation, what should happen is our sphere should be extinct, which we can see here. That is actually what's going on. Back to plane polarized light. Let's see if we can rotate our sphere and notice if there's pleochroism or not in this direction. So there is pleochroism with rotation in this direction. Here's a side-by-side -side view of what's going on so you can tell the difference. Uh, we have the lighter color associated with refractive index epsilon and a darker color associated with refractive index omega. So we'll rotate the sphere a couple times back and forth, so hopefully you can catch the difference between these two colors. 
And what you should also be getting from this is that the sphere is just a bit more difficult to deal with than the nicely oriented corundum sample with flat faces that you can just kind of leave on a surface and won't roll away. Did I mention that cubes are better than spheres? So we stop the rotation of our corundum sphere in an orientation where we should be aligned with refractive index omega. All right, so let's bring in our upper polarizer again. And our sphere is at extinction, which means we are indeed aligned with refractive index omega. We begin to rotate our sphere and light starts to be transmitted as an interference color. And then of course I let go of the sphere and it rolls away. And so begins the journey of reorienting the corundum sphere. To be honest, we were at the end of that demonstration, and so what I'm actually going to do, let's just go take a look at the bigger corundum sphere. There are a couple differences to note, however, because the 20mm corundum sphere is much larger than our 10mm corundum sphere. As such, the light from our polariscope has to travel through a bunch more corundum before it reaches us, and so the large corundum sphere is overall dimmer than the smaller sphere that we looked at. So starting out in plain polarized light, if we view our sample in a variety of different orientations, you can actually see some of the pleochroism going on with our corundum sphere. I find the best way to orient the corundum sphere, however, is actually to start out with crossed polarizers and then hunt down the optic axis interference figure for our corundum, and then you know you're looking down the optic axis and the C crystallographic axis. For the 20 millimeter corundum sphere, there's much less light reaching us, but this is actually the optic axis interference figure that we're seeing right here. And that means we're looking down the optic axis and the C crystallographic axis of our corundum, in this view, we should only see light associated with refractive index omega. Once again, ignoring the complications arising from our corundum being spherical. So going back to plain polarized light, this means that we shouldn't be able to see pleochroism in this view. So let's rotate our corundum sphere now and see if we notice any change in color. And there's not really much of anything going on as we rotate the sample in this direction. We'll bring in the upper polarizer again, just to make sure we're still looking down the C crystallographic axis. That looks pretty good. And now we're going to flip our sample 90 degrees so that we're looking down the plane of the A axes. And hopefully you notice that change in pleochroic color there when we did that flip. So our plane polarized light vibrating in a north-south direction is now aligned with refractive index epsilon of our corundum. Let's bring in our upper polarizer to confirm this. Our sample should be at extinction if we're aligned with refractive index epsilon, and it is. We'll return to our view with plain polarized light, and what we'll do next is attempt to rotate our sample so that we go from being aligned with refractive index epsilon to aligning our plain polarized light vibrating in a north-south direction with refractive index omega. So we can see pleochroism with this view of our corundum sphere, Here's images of pleochroic end member colors associated with epsilon and omega side by side so that you can more easily tell the difference. So at this particular moment, we should have our plain polarized light aligned with refractive index omega. Let's bring in our upper polarizer and check and see if our sphere is at extinction. And it is. Hooray! And if we begin to rotate our sphere with crossed polarizers, you'll notice it begins to transmit light as an interference color when we're aligned with neither epsilon nor omega. So those are all the fun experiments I wanted to show you with the corundum sphere. Let's now compare and contrast the corundum sphere with our previous corundum sample. So the previous corundum sample from the corundum kit has a simple geometry for its interaction with light. You don't have to think too hard about Snell's law. And if the corundum sample is laying on one of its flat polished surfaces, you have two fixed views that you're going to be viewing through the corundum crystal. One of these looks along the plane of the A crystallographic axes of our corundum, and the other looks along the C crystallographic axis. These are the two most important views for understanding the optical properties of our corundum, 
and how we can use those optical properties to either identify corundum or to orient corundum in space. So I would say the corundum sample is best for when you're first starting out trying to understand optical properties. In contrast, the corundum sphere has a much more complex geometry for light interacting with our corundum, and you're going to have to think a little bit more about Snell's law and critical angles and such. But one of the benefits of the corundum sphere is that you can actually take a wide variety of different views through our corundum to understand the optical properties. Let's do a quick theoretical example of what I mean. So here we have our optical indicatrix for corundum, and with our corundum sample, you're pretty much stuck with these two views. But with our corundum sphere, you're not really stuck here. You can take whatever view you want to through the corundum crystal. Want to look at 30 degrees inclined to the C crystallographic axis? Sure, why not? What you end up with then is a section through our optical indicatrix perpendicular to our direction of view, and that would end up looking something like this, where we have an ellipse with axes of omega and epsilon prime. Epsilon prime is going to be a value in between omega and epsilon, just depending on the actual orientation of that view. And we'll be able to see pleochroism in this view, but it won't be the maximum difference in pleochroic colors. And we'll be able to see an interference color in this view, but it won't be the maximum interference color. So the corundum sphere offers us much more freedom in our exploration of the optical properties of corundum. However, it requires a great deal more thought to deal with appropriately. So I'd say the corundum sphere is more for when you feel comfortable with the optical properties and you're starting to get some expertise in what's going on and you want a bit of a challenge for yourself. So I hope you'll consider purchasing a corundum sphere from Snellius Minerals. Once again, we have the two different sizes of 10 millimeters and 20 millimeters. These are made of a synthetic flame fusion corundum. Snellius Minerals is an eBay store located at the following address. Check out some of the other nerdy minerals while you're there. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to reach out to us via email at snelliusminerals at gmail.com. Here are the references I used in the construction of this video. I hope you found this video educational. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.